I, I like Father's Day, although it's, it's been rough, and I'll just come like right out and say it's been really rough because my dad left to heaven about three years ago. And June, if you saw my post on Facebook, uh, June's kind of a rough month in some ways. My, my dad passed on June 4th. His birthday was on June 13th. And then there's Father's Day on the 20th. So it's always, you know, tough. But I really, I really appreciate Father's Day because now I'm a dad. Now I'm a grandfather, which is really cool. Um, yeah, woo! So, <laughs> you guys know how much I love my kids. But I, I, um, it's a good challenge for men, you know, Pastor Debbie prayed about. It, it's a good challenge. Um, because being a dad for me, it's, it's really emotional. I love, I was telling somebody, one of my connections to God is through, like, kids. Like, some people love creation. Some people connect through God, with Father God through music. Others through, um, you know, some other type of just reading the word. And, and I connect those different ways, too. But when it comes to, like, kids, uh, I just love them. Love, 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 love. Love my kids. Love my grandkids. Uh, I, love, I can't spend enough time with them. Because was, I was telling uh, Pastor Tommy once when he was, uh, oh, he left. Pastor told me once, before he had Daniel and Ivy, I said, there's nothing like holding this little child like in your hands, just like this when they're first born, right? Dad's right. Uh, you, you hold them, and it's just, it's so cool. And I, I look at them, and I would think, how can somebody not believe in God? I mean, look what I'm holding. This is a miracle. This is totally cool. Uh, and then they get older. <laughs> and it's still cool. <laughs> But, I mean, they're so fragile when they're little, and you, you, you pray for them. You want, you want them to make the right choices, and you, you want to have a connection with them, and you want to be able to protect them and love them and make sure no harm comes, comes you know, upon them. And, and uh, you know, my dad was the same way. And, you know, we talked about this before, but just real briefly. So we lost our house in the fire, and, and, um, and we ran out really quick because things were, you know, coming down on us, and we didn't know how much time we had, so we, we didn't really grab anything. And so I lost like all my, my Bibles and I lost uh, my notes and books and you know, every, basically everything. But um, so I, I ran through my office and you know, you start thinking, what do I grab, what do I grab? And your sense tells you nothing. It tells you get out, right? You go into this self-preservation mode. But um, I grabbed something on my way out and I, I kind of, I guess I know why now. It's, it's my dad's Bible. Right? It's the only Bible I have now. So I use this, you know, for men's groups, all I got. And what's really cool, of all the things that I lost of my dad, you know, his music, his CDs, the videotapes, the albums, the, you know, pictures, photos, his instruments, his bass, his amp, you know, his congas, his everything, the memorabilia, it's, it's all gone. But what I have left from my dad is the one thing that is the most important. It's the Word of God. Right? And it even has this, and I bought this Bible from my dad like 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And it's engraved with his name on it, and we have the same name, so that's cool. But the, the thing about it is, of all the things like my dad taught me, he taught me just how to love and how to tell people you love them, and, and I'm proud of you, and I appreciate you. And it's really like, you know, Daniel, my grandson, will come up to me and just out of the blue, just, I love you, Tata, you're the bestest. And I'm like, cool, thanks. And, and I, I know that Tommy and Mary are very loving, but also I'm just thanking my dad for a moment because that's what he did. My dad really taught me just how to love and tell people I love them. And, um, and I was thinking this morning that, you know, my dad would do anything to protect us and save us. And I'm thinking, okay, well, Father God, that my dad learned that from, from you, God, because that's who Father God is. He just wants to love us, protect us. He wants to save us. He wants to keep us from harm. He did everything that, that he should have done and wanted to do to, to save us and make sure that we have this relationship with him that was so broken. And we broke it. We broke that relationship. So he sent his son, Jesus. It's the only thing that he could have done to repair this relationship, to reconcile us back to God. So I was thinking about how much my dad was such a protector. And that's exactly who, who God is. You know, one day we'll live safe and sound with our Father God and get away from all this tough stuff, the trials and tribulations, and yes, there's victories and there's great moments, but I, I do look forward to a time when, hey, you know, I'm all together with my family in heaven and all this stuff is over with. I'm not trying to rush it, uh, but I, God tells us to look up. He tells us to anticipate it, be ready for it. So that's what we're trying to do right now, and I've been feeling this way for a while, hey dad, um, about our church and what the direction, what the focus is. So. 
in the last several months we've been talking about real challenging messages like do you know your testimony do you know your identity you know how how well are you are you connecting with God and, and with others and you know can you explain the gospel and can you explain who Father God is and who the Holy Spirit is and how he works in our lives and do you know Galatians 5 and what it means to walk in the spirit and walk in the world and can you explain somebody what the gospel is and, and yes, heaven, and yes, and salvation, yes, 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 but also, can you, when you explain the gospel, do you know how to explain what perish means? Because that's part of the gospel too, right? Because it's, God doesn't want not one person to perish, but to come to repentance in Jesus Christ and spend eternity with Him. Can we explain that to somebody too? Right? So we were talking last week about um, how to connect with God, how to focus on God, how to get more at this point. And we talked about Peter who walked on the water. And what happened to Peter? He started to sink when he took his focus off of Christ. Very common message and it should be preached as much as possible. Because it's just the simplicity of it. We take our eyes off of Jesus. We're looking at something else. We're focusing on something else. We're focusing on the world. We're focusing on our past, our anxieties, our worries, the troubles, the challenges, you know, the politics, the culture, whatever. You're focusing on something else if you're not focusing on Christ. Amen? So we were talking about how, you know, he focused on Jesus, they walked back to the boat, and kudos for Peter for getting out of the boat, sinking, yeah, okay. But then he, you know, Jesus rose him up and they walked back to the boat. I love that. I, I love that about Peter. He had that moment of faith, but he refocused on Jesus. And then we talked about, I'm doing a quick recap, and we talked about real quick how when they got back to the boat, the disciples that were there with him and knew this was Jesus and how we want more and more of Jesus and we should desire and hunger for him every single day. We should be like every morning say, oh, I'm not satisfied, I want more Jesus, right? So when they got back in the boat, the disciples say, truly, you are the Son of God. They got more Jesus at that moment, more revelation knowledge, right? Well, now the work begins. See, if we want to spend more time with God, and I challenged you guys last week and I said, okay, there's about three or four, like, huh, I'll say five. There's about five topics that pastors um, are talked about, or with, I'm trying to say this delicately. <laughs> People will come up to me and talk to me a lot. And they'll say, hey, this, 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 I believe this, 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 and that. And um, one of like the top five topics they bring up is how and more, too. How and more. Like, I want more, I want more, I want more this, more that, why don't you give them more this, more that, more that. And then how? How do we do this? How do we do this? The more part of it I talked about last week. Because our more here in church is a supplement to the more that you're supposed to be having outside of these walls. Right? So, you won't, so if you weren't here last week, I want to recap that. Because this next part is really important. You're here for 1.5, maybe 2 hours on a Sunday morning. So we like, we're like, Doing the three E's. We're exalting God, we're edifying the believers, and we're evangelizing the lost. That's what I believe church is for. That's what the Bible says. We exalt God, we edify the believers, and we evangelize the lost, right? So the 1.5 or 2 hours you spend here is not going to feed you everything that you need. Because there's 166.5 other hours in the week where you should be feeding yourself. And if you get here to church, you're like, I'm so starving. I, I haven't spent time with God all week. You're starving yourself. You're starving yourself. So yes, we are to give you more and more, but our more is a supplement to the more you're supposed to be having when you're outside these walls. Is that too much convicting? Can I get an amen? You're, scare you're scaring me. You're too quiet. <laughs> Can we play another song? <laughs> Chris, get up. Come on, let's go. <laughs> See, here's, here's the work begins, because the more part I think I covered last week, and if you didn't hear last week's message, please go back on Facebook or YouTube uh, and listen to it. The second part is the how part. People are always saying, well, how? How do I get more of God? How do I get over, over, over my past? How do I fix this relationship problem? How, 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 how? And it's great. It's, it's a wonderful word because it's what we should be doing. How, Jesus? Show me your way, Lord. Show me, God. Show me the path, Lord. And that's, I think we pray that a lot. Lord, show me. Show me your will. Show me your purpose. You know, what do you have for me, God? How do I do this? How do I overcome this? How do I get past this? Over it, through it, under it. Just how? So I, I'm okay with that word. I think what I've learned and i convicted about at times is I know the how, but I just don't do it. You know, you get a little lazy, you get a little too much into yourself. So how? When I'm 
kind of full of myself and I'm trying to, I can't get past some of the roadblocks that even I've put up. How, how do I draw near to God? How am I going to be able to get more? How am I going to be able to overcome? And I know I'm focusing on the word how, but I am trying to drill this home. The book of James. It's called by scholars like the, like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And I love it for men, and women of course too, but men we went through it in Bible study because it's to the point. It's point blank. It's like this, and then God is this, and you shouldn't be this, and you shouldn't be that. It's these short like, like sound bites of, of God's word that just, they're like me. A little blunt, a little direct, you know, focused, and I, I like that. I, that ministers to me. So I like when God just says, hey, stop it. You know, or, or hey, start this, or hey, continue that. I, I love that. So, so the book of James, and if you didn't know, uh, James is, is, was the brother of God. This is the James that was the brother of God, or the brother of Jesus. And, and he actually was stoned to death, which is kind of sad. <clears throat> he was stoned to death. But James is basically... <coughs> I'm going to need some water. I'm talking really quick. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. So James is addressing a lot of issues. A lot of issues to the church. And the church is dealing with a lot of things that we're still dealing with today, obviously. And he gives this verse that's up there. He gives James 4, 7, 8. He says, So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You're the man. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. So I read that, and I'm going, I want to know context. I want to be able to explain to everybody exactly what God's trying to tell us. So James is addressing something really important. And I love the way the book of James starts out because it's like, bam. It's like right there. He says, greetings. Hey, you know, James 1. And I'm paraphrasing because he didn't go, hey. But <laughs> that's how I talk. That's how I hear God. Hey, Alfredo, what's up? Okay, God, what did I do? <laughs> But this letter is from James, he says. I'm a slave of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm writing to the 12 tribes, all the Jewish believers scattered abroad. He's basically talking to everybody, right? And I like the way he says, hey, greetings. And he goes right into, dear brothers and sisters, <laughs> when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. And what's wisdom? Wisdom is having the knowledge of how to do things, right? Knowledge is having, like, the, the information on how to do things. Wisdom is actually applying it and doing it. So he says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, make sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person who divided with divided loyalty is as an unsettled wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. So I love the way that starts out, and I probably the way I hear God, I'm going to paraphrase it. It's like, it's like he's saying, you know, fellow believers, life is nuts, and this world is crazy, and you can't depend on it. You can't lean on it. You can't change it. All you can do is rely, trust, and hope in God. He's the one that's going to give you this joy no matter what you're dealing with. He's the one who's going to give you this strength when you don't think you can handle things. God is going to be the one who is all you need. You don't need anything that this world offers you. Focus on that. Have faith in that. That's how God, that's how I hear Him. And James lays it out. He says, to a church that at a time wasn't exactly doing everything that he was warning them about, they were getting caught up in the useless ways of the world. James 4, 7, 10 says, the how. This is it. So if you have your iPads, notes, whatever, uh, Androids. I've had a heck of a week with Apple products this week. <laughs> but anyway, he says in James 4, 7 to 10, the how. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he, God, will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. 
grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Now, is he, is he praying that on us? No, no, that's not what he's saying. In other words, he's saying, focusing on this world is only going to bring you sorrow and grief and sadness and strife and anxiety and worry and depression and you can go on and on and on. He's saying what God offers when you focus on Him is the joy that you can count on. The joy that you can count on when you focus on God. When you want more of Jesus. You want more of the Word. More of leading of the Holy Spirit. That joy that will pass and overcome all these trials and tribulations that we have to deal with. Now, take a pause for a second. Trials and tribulations. Some things we can't avoid. Some things just happen. What God wants us to do is focus in on so much that we don't create the trials and tribulations that we can avoid. We, we don't want to bring this upon ourselves. So God, whatever the world brings me, okay, you got my back, I trust you. Lord, help me focus on you so I don't bring that world into my life and create problems, trials, and tribulations that shouldn't be there in the first place. You got it? And I'm speaking from experience. Okay. And my wife says, Amen. Okay. <laughs> so, he says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up in honor. That's James 4.10. Humble yourselves. Humble. Biblical definition of humble. It's a release. It's, a, it's going to God saying, I'm releasing everything to you. Everything. I'm humbling myself, and what I'm saying to you, God, is I realize have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I can't do this without you. I'm humbling myself to you, giving you everything that I have. That's the biblical definition of humble. So, okay. What does this mean to each one of us? Well, we're going to do something a little different. I think I left this on the message yesterday on Facebook. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. Um, we are actually going to go through something that's called a uh, spiritual assessment. It's an assessment for spiritual health. And before you change the slide, hang on there for a second. So what I do, what I feel like we're supposed to do, and this is for myself too, for all of us, I'm going to kind of download on us enough of these answers of how to maybe some of the questions and the challenges we have. Because I totally believe that this church is in the right direction. I totally know, I've just been so focused talking to my prayer team and my leaders. I'm so focused on what God has for us right now. He wants us to be this active church that's taking ground, not losing it. A, a ground where people can come here and worship the Lord and grow your relationship no matter where you are, whether you're just meeting Christ for the first time or whether you've known Him for 5 years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, that the Word and the manna and stuff that God gives us is, is milk to the people that need milk and for the people that need meat that have been around for a while, that they grow with that. Because the Word talks about milk and, and meat. And if you're a baby or infant, you've got to go in the milk. You can't give a baby meat up until they're, I think it's a year old, right? So, and... So, the point is, is that what we're going to do today, I think it's important for all of us. So, I'm going to have, Ken, you can turn on that backlight. I'm going to have the ushers come out. We're going to hand everybody a piece of paper. And there's like a hundred and something of them. And I'm going to tell you, we're not going to do the spiritual assessment now. We're going to go over it. And you're going to do this on your own time. In your own alone time with God. When you go in that secret place and you say, God, I'm clearing my desk. I'm clearing my plate, and I'm going to spend some time with you, and I'm going to go through this, because I want more, 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 and I want to know how. Okay? And I'm going to thank Peggy Mitchell, because I lost all my notes and all my books, everything in the fire, and I actually had a spiritual assessment, and Peggy's been giving me notes and things from her mother. Then I went through all of them the other day, and I went, ah, the spiritual assessment. So it's great. So it's a good God thing. Thank you, dear. So what we're going to do with this spiritual assessment, if you want pens, you can have pens. We're going to go over it. And for people at home <clears throat> on, on Facebook, get your pen and papers ready and write this down. And what I'm going to do later on today is I'm going to post this sheet on our Facebook page that you can download it and you guys can do this at home. So, but for now, take a pen and paper and you can go through this and write your notes. So when you do this on your own, one-on-one -on -one time with God, you're ready for it. You know what's going to happen. Now, for some of you, this may be milk. Like, oh, I didn't know this. Oh, I never thought about this. Right? Great. Wonderful. 
For some of you, it may be like this meat. Oh, this is great. I need to reinforce this in my life. Oh, I need to get back to this. I need to focus more on this. <clears throat> and then Curtis and Mike and Norman, those guys out in the foyer. Great. When everybody has one, we'll start. In the meantime, we're going to take notes. So let me preface this a little bit. It says, assessments are vital for things to function properly and be as healthy as possible. We take assessments for our emotional health, our mental health, our physical health. But we really need to focus on our spiritual health. We must place our relationship and focus on God as first priority. One side of this is the spiritual health assessment. The other side is uh, Bible verses that I put on there that I believe are our focus that will help you through this. If our spiritual health is out of whack, we will struggle with the other aspects of our lives as well. Use these 25 questions to assess your spiritual health in order to bring you closer in your relationship with God and to follow His purpose and will for your life. And it's really cool. Now, I like doing things like this. I've been doing them a lot, especially when I worked for a big company before. There's always these assessments. Uh, but this one I'm, I'm really, really excited about. It's those ones where you go, okay, scale to one to five. I rarely do this. I seldom do this. I sometimes do this. Uh, four, I usually do this. Five, man, I'm on it. I'm frequent. So you're going to assign a number to each statement, one through five. You don't have to do it now. If you can, great. If not, please do this later. We're just going to go through it. It's broken down into some topics. One through five is focusing on our faith and our relationship with Jesus. Six through 15, allowing God to work in our lives and knowing our identity in Christ. 16 through 18 is our love for others and the way we forgive. And why is forgiveness kind of highlighted on this? Because we all have problems with it. 19, forgiveness is like one of the biggest roadblocks. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest roadblocks we can have in our lives. 19 through 21 is about sharing our faith and knowing our testimony. And then 22 to 25 ends with, do you guys know you have backup? You know you're part of a family? You know that God's given you gifts to be able to use in His kingdom? You know you're not alone? You have friends, brothers and sisters that are there for you? All right. Everybody have one? Ready? Okay, we're going to go through this. If you've got a question, you can shout it out. That's cool. The first one is super important. I submit to Christ's lordship over my life. And the second one is my relationship with Christ is motivated more by love than duty or fear. Do I know who Christ is? Do I say, you are king? The names of God are amazing. He's our provider. He's our comforter. He's our king, our righteousness. He's our healer. He's so much to us. Do we, do we go to God and say, Lord, you are in control. I'm not. Because every time I'm in control, I just mess it up. And my motivation for Christ is because he loves us. We love him because he first loved us. It's not because, man, if I don't follow God's will, he's going to strike me down. Or I'm so afraid of God, I just don't want to go to hell. No matter what, I just don't want to be in hell, which is great. I don't want to be in hell, and I'm not going there. But our motivation should be, wow, Jesus really loves me. Look what he's done for me. I want to get to know who he is. I want to spend time with Christ because he loves us so much. I just, I just want to fellowship with him. And if I want to learn about God, if I want more, number three, I regularly read and study my Bible, which I don't and I should. I have regular quiet time and look forward to that worship priority time with Christ. Life gets really busy and I was talking about this with somebody else the other day. Life gets so full, it's like, okay, God, I'll get to you tonight. I'll spend some time tonight. No, we've talked about this. We hear, he hears our voice in the morning. Spend time, put it aside, prioritize it, and you'll be just amazed at how the rest of your day falls in line. Um, number five, when I pray to God, I'm aware that I need to pause and listen to God's voice. Okay, I'll use myself as an example. A lot of my prayers are, God, I got to tell you what's going on. I'm, I need this, and I, this, this happened today, and I'm overwhelmed, and I'm, I didn't understand this, and I'm tired, and I need this, I need that. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Right? It's like, do we ever pause and go, God, you know exactly what I'm thinking. You know exactly what I'm feeling before I even say it. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm just going to shut up, and I'm going to listen to you. I'm just going to listen. I got my worship music on. I got my hand on the word. Speak to me, God. 
Let me have an open mind, an open heart, open ears. Let me hear. Let me just pause. God will talk to us. And we don't do that enough. Six, when the Bible exposes an area in my life that's needing change, that will draw me closer to him, I respond and strive to follow his direction. That's a big one. I don't even think I need to explain that. Let's go to number seven. <laughs> when making choices, I look for Christ's guidance first. Mm, yeah, I can, I can be a little like, you know, think first and, you know, pray later. I, I want to be able to be better. I want to be able to pray and then respond. And I usually don't sometimes. I'm better, but I have a long way to go still. Still a work in progress. Eight, I know the difference between walking in the word, the spirit, and walking in the world. This is a big one in our church from the very first message. I've been harping on everybody to please read Galatians 5. If there's part of this that you want to help yourself with, I'd say write this down. Go back and read Galatians 5, chapter 5, the whole chapter. It was the most life-changing chapter word of God for me. It tells me point blank the way I communicate. This is what's going to happen when you walk in the world. This is what you can expect. Strife, anger, jealousies, parties, rubberies, sexual morality, you know, fits of wrath, all these horrible things. But when you walk in the Spirit, this is the fruit that He gives you. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and self-control, right? He gives you these things. So read that because it cleared up a lot of things for me. This one I really, really love. Number nine. During church worship, I experience the presence of God's Spirit and focus on how God is working in my heart and mind and in my life as a result. So one of my great connections with God besides, you know, kids and family, it's worship, the music. It's like I feel God working. I feel His Spirit coming down and just, and I, I think a lot during worship. I'm like, God, I just like, things are exposed and it's like, oh God, I'm worshiping you, but now I'm, I'm starting to feel something's coming up. There's a block here, Lord. I'm starting to get some revelation knowledge here that there's something in my life that, that's going on that's kind of a block between my worship with you, and it comes in my mind during worship. And things start to break, and I feel better, and there's healing that happens during worship. Worship is so important, and Debbie's been really great at this lately. I've been coming home, and there's, wor mer there's worship and praise music being played in the background. We need more. More, more, more. You know what, what God wants from us? He just, he just wants us to love and worship Him. Amen? Circle that one. Highlight it. Put an X on it. A cross. Post it on your forehead. We'll get that one. Um, the next one is, I know my identity. It's who Jesus says I am, not who others say I am. I'm going to go from there because I think we realize that one. I realize God has forgiven me of my past and I repent and place His will first in my life. That's like the foundation. Twelve, if I stumble and fall, I realize God's mercies are new every day and is rooting for me as I strive to move forward and live and learn from conviction and not condemnation. Pause. Okay, I'll put myself in this too. So many people, too many of us, have heard and listened and taken to heart who people said we were and who we weren't in our past. We've got beaten up over some really lousy language that people have just dropped into us and we didn't let it go. We let it root and, and grow and it's been really hard to get rid of some of this stuff. Focus on this one. This is a big one. Because if I listen to everything that people have told me in my past what I was and couldn't be, I just wouldn't be here right now. I knew, started to figure out who I was in Christ. Who my identity was. Not who people said I was. Amen. And there's too much of our past that we're still dragging around, that we're still carrying around, and I, I don't want it anymore. Amen? So, the next one, um, I have fellow Christians in my life to hold me accountable for spiritual growth. If you don't have some guy that you can talk to, like this inner circle person that you can talk to, that you can just be accountable to and say, here's what I'm struggling with, you need one. Get one. Men, women, get an accountability partner. Have somebody that you can process, somebody you trust, somebody you can talk to, somebody that you're able to just kind of be unfiltered with, that you can explain. Now, this is God, of course, but when God says be accountable to one another, when he says have these people in your life, Jesus had 
Peter, John, and James. He had those three around him. Those were his inner circle people. And there's things he exposed them to they didn't expose the other disciples to. 14. Peace and contentment characterize my life rather than worry and anxiety. I think we've covered that one. I want to move on. I trust in God to provide and help me through any problem or crisis I face in life. You know we're not going through this life alone, right? You know whatever you're going through right now, whatever that roadblock is, you know you're not by yourself. You know you have a God that never leaves you nor forsakes you. You know, even in your quiet moments when you, when you are alone and you feel alone, you know you're not. There is no mountain Christ can't break down. Just a little bit of faith will move that mountain. So please rely on Him. I strive to live in harmony with family. <laughs> I knew I'd stumble on this one. I strive to live in harmony with members of my family, Christian or not Christian. You guys know I have some family members that don't know the Lord yet. Um, I love them dearly, 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 with all my heart. So I need to show them that Christ love. I forgive others when their actions hurt and humbly seek forgiveness from the ones I've hurt. Like we said, forgiveness is one of the, unforgiveness is one of the major roadblocks. We want to get rid of that one. 18, we're almost done. I realize that people may fail me, but God will never fail, leave, nor forsake me. 19, my actions demonstrate a belief in and commitment to the Great Commission. Okay, there's a shift. Here's a gear. We know we're works in progress. We know that we have a ways to go. We know that we're not everything we'd like to be. We're, we're, we're works in progress. We work on it. So nothing is better to me that when I hear somebody, I just heard this yesterday from a person. Somebody came to my house and was looking to do some, you know, landscaping. And we, he was a Christian and we started talking about things. And he was talking about how he had this big smile on his face. It was exactly what I needed for the day. Big smile on his face. He came, just lifted me up, and he was like, tell me all these ways that he's sharing Jesus with his, with, uh, with his co-workers. And we said, yeah, my boss came up to me and said, hey, why are you always smiling? Why, why do you have this big smile on your face? You know, and he said, well, in my workplace, I'm not, to, not supposed to talk about faith or religions. Or, he goes, but somebody asked me why I'm always smiling. I'm going to tell them the truth. And he says, I looked at my boss and said, it's because I have Jesus. That no matter what happens, I have Jesus. The best thing that can happen to us when we're talking about evangelism, evangelism and sharing our faith is when we don't say anything and somebody walks up to you and says, hey, I, I noticed there's something different about you. What is it? You're always, you know, think looking on the bright side or you're always smiling or you're always encouraging or... I see you, what's going on? And when you can say, it's Christ in my life. 20. I share and make my faith known to non-believers and pray for non-believers in my life. 21. When confronted about my faith, I remain consistent and firm in my testimony. Testimonies are what we need to work on. I, I didn't have that in the past. You know, I was, I was one of the talk the talk, not walk the walk, people. Um, you know, church on Sundays and Monday through Saturdays were devastating to my life. So, working our testimony is 24-7. I strive to be part of a church community and tend to participate when able. We all know God says, don't forsake the assembly of the people. I was losing it, not being able to meet in this building when they shut us down for COVID. I was just like, Losing it. I had to be here with people. I have to. So that's why God says it's good for us to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Woohoo! Okay. I sacrificially offer the resources God has blessed me with, with the church and the community. Uh, that's tithing, offering, but it's not just money. It's, it's your gifts. It's your, it's your talents. It's your service. It's, it's everything. Do I, do I, am I part of my community? Um, and then, 24, I understand my spiritual gifts and use them to serve others. And the last one... I pray God will use me every day in His kingdom work. I pray every day that I'm working for God. The Word says I don't work for people. I don't work for man. I do my work as for the Lord. Amen? Right, so what you do with this is you're going to like go through in your quiet time and you're going to assess one through five. You know, five, 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 one, one. Is there a zero somewhere? There's no zero. Okay, highlight these areas. Take your total score and divide it by 25. You'll figure out an overall composite score. 
3.2, 4.1, 1.8, it'll come out. And all the scores that are two or less, there's your how. Any score that's two or less, that's your focus. If you've got something that was a one or a two, that's it. Any score that's two or less, that's it. That's your how. That's where you're going to get more of God. If you come across something and you say, I'm having problems forgiving people. There it is. Lord, how do I get more of you? How do I remove roadblocks? I'm going to learn how to forgive people. I'm going to release offenses and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm working on this, God. And if all these 25 questions, if there's just one thing, just one thing that hits you, great, that's success. Go for it. That's the one thing you're going to work on. And if all you did is work on these things one at a time, perfect. But the whole point of us is to move forward our relationship with Christ. If you want more of God, let's start someplace. Well, this is where we can start. Amen? Now, on the other side of that paper, there's these foundational Bible verses that can grow our relationship with God. So, no, really? Oh, then we have other ones back there. Um, Curtis, can you check the back? Because there's a big bunch of Bible verses. And then I'm going to post these on Facebook later. Then, matter of fact, Joy, here. They gave you one? Great. Okay, good. Hey, Curtis, if there's other ones back there, you can bring those out if everybody has a duplicate. I was doing this at like 2 in the morning, so. <laughs> so now there's these moment, amazing moments for, with God that are waiting for us. If we do what the Word says, if we take our time, we humble ourselves, and we draw near to God. When we draw close to Him, He draws close to us. And the devil basically says, I'm out of here. I can't waste any more time with this person. I'm not going to be able to affect their life. I'm not going to be able to attack them anymore. I'm going to give up. Because they're drawn so close to God, I'm, I'm burning. I, I, I can't handle it. And Satan says, I'm out. There's a reason why he says, draw close to God. He'll draw close to you. And the devil, he will flee. Okay, that's about what he is. He's a flea. Okay. So... There's only two choices in life. I'm, I'm going to end with this. And I've said this before. There's only two choices in life. You can go through life because life's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Things are going to happen. You can go through life with God or you can go through life without God. And it's much easier when you go through life with God. Those are the only two choices we have in life. We can have joy even when there's trials and tough times. We can have peace and comfort even when life gets difficult. His Spirit will offer direction when the world just wants to give us a lost path. We can have love and fellowship with the Savior of the world. We can have victory and not defeat. We can actually see some wins in the win column, right? We don't walk around defeated. That's not who Christ created us to be. We can have assurance in our salvation and this eternity with God. And until then, I'm going to work as hard as I can to bring more and more of Christ into my life. The more you get to know Christ, the more you fall in love with Him, the more you start to realize just how much Jesus loves you, what God did for us, and how the Holy Spirit can truly lead us, because I want this church to go to this other level I know that God has for us. I want more people walking the doors that are saying, you know, I haven't been in church for a few years. I, I want to reconnect with God. I want people to walk in the door that say, you know what, I've never really thought about God, but the world is scaring me right now. And I figure there's something else out there other than what this world is offering me. And I've been thinking about God lately. I've been thinking about Jesus. And I'm going to say, welcome, come on in. I want the person that walks in and says, you know, I've known Christ for 30 years, but I feel stale. There's an overwhelming thing that's happening in my life. This is happening. This is happening. And I need some place to fellowship. I need some place that's going to read the word, that's going to worship, that's going to fellowship, that's going to focus on the love of Jesus. I need a place that does that. I want that this, this place to be it. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm going to mess up. Things are going to happen. I don't mean to offend anybody. And I really don't. I'm pretty direct, but I don't, I don't mean anything. But I, I'm feeling an urgency, right? I'm feeling an urgency to tell people who Jesus is. To get back on track on the path that God wants us to have. And I want more. You know, Debbie and I, we struggle. You know, it's, it's been difficult, you know, with health issues and losing people and losing houses. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a hard life. But like the disciples said, when Jesus said, Okay, are you guys going to leave me too? And the disciples said, Well, whoa, whoa, 
Where else are we going to go? Who else has the answers to life? Who, who else? Where else can I go but to the Lord? Get to know Jesus. No matter how long you've known Him, it's always time, every moment, every day, there's always a moment to get more of Christ and to ask Him how. I like those words. Let's pray. Father God, you're amazing. 